We good? Yes. Tron, are you there? I am. I am. Oh, cracker. All right. Go for it, mate. Uh, good, uh, good afternoon, afternoon and effects. effects. And hello, hello to everyone uh, who is uh, watching, watching the conference, conference online. online. Um, today, today I want to talk, talk about, about uh, collection dynamics, dynamics. And, uh, which is, I think, a, another word for ever-changing collection policies uh, and how we uh, still try to tell new stories uh, every day. I hope you can see my screen um, because this is how the Netherlands looked like in the 17th century. Uh, a lot of water. And um, as you can see, um, the entire Netherlands, the Low Countries, well, the, the name the Low Countries is, of course, uh, because it's it's next to the, the North Sea. So you might be wondering, where does this Atlantic uh, come from? Well, I'll, I'll deal with that later on. Um, this might be an image that you are familiar with when it comes to Dutch maritime history. It's uh, ships in a Dutch roadstead, uh, painted by Adam Willaert, um, a painting that sums it up all very nicely. You see many uh, sailing ships uh, abound to, to, to sail uh, the oceans. And at the same time, on a beach, you see that there are people uh, on a fish market selling fish. Uh, people are carried in a small boat uh, to the ships. And uh, this is this sums up the Dutch maritime economy in the 17th, 18th and even 19th century. Um, another image you might know from the Dutch is the enormous naval battles they fought with uh, several European neighbors uh, throughout the 17th century. And this is also Dutch maritime history. And uh, especially the building uh, on the right is interesting because that's the naval arsenal. And as Michael uh, already mentioned uh, this morning in this talk, is now the building that houses the Scheepvaart Museum or National Maritime Museum of the Netherlands. Um, this image, uh, the National Maritime Museum as it uh, is today, uh, sums it up nicely, I think. Uh, there's a replica of a Dutch East Indiaman from the 18th century. Um, on the right, you see the clipper uh, Stad Amsterdam, uh, which still uh, travels the oceans, but when it's in Amsterdam, it's always moored next to the, the Scheevaart Museum. You can see a steamship, an icebreaker from 1900, the Christian Brunings. In a small building on the jetty, there is the Royal Barge, and in that majestic building is the collection of the Scheevaart Museum, uh, a building that was used by the Dutch Navy. Um, and in many ways, this is how many maritime museums, of course, uh, have their collections organized. Uh, there is a story about the Navy, uh, there is a, a story about the National Merchant Navy, uh, about small craft, maybe some archaeology, um, and the Scheevaart Museum is no different. The collection um, is, uh, well, formed since 1916, when uh, the first objects came into the collection, and it focuses on the 17th, 18th century. It focuses on the history of uh, commerce, uh, on the Navy, uh, and later on after the Second World War, also about Dutch sailors. But when I sum up the public debate at the moment, we see that many requests, uh, demands, um, and also just sim simply questions from the public uh, are not about the 17th century uh, or are not about uh, the emergence of the, uh, the, 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 the merchant uh, marine. Uh, first of all, there is an, a, a, and we might say, perceived invisibility of the maritime sector in modern society. Um, people ask that maritime history should be more inclusive. It should be for everyone. People even ask to decolonize the museums because many museums and maritime museums uh, are, I think, even uh, one of the, the, the major museums in this, this discussion is to decolonize the museum because it's a colonial history and uh, colonial history is a part of maritime history. Um, people would like to see us show more sides to one story, 
um, we claim as an authority that we tell a story, but there are more sides to a story. But how do we do that? Already, uh, with many of my colleagues before me uh, noted, the urgency of climate change and sea level rise. How do museums uh, deal with this? Uh, plastic soup and the pollution of the seas. And the facts and authenticity in a digital world. Um, museums are still about objects. And uh, that is, of course, uh, not always the case. And even I am giving my presentation here in a digital form. Um, the perceived invisibility of the maritime sector was, um, I think, um, clearly made by the ever given stock in the Suez Canal, was already mentioned by Joost in the, in, in the previous talk. Uh, but all of a sudden, everyone realized that everything um, on the world is transported in a container and containers happen to be on these uh, gi gigantic uh, container ships nowadays. Uh, sea level rise, you've probably seen the traveling exhibition Rising Tide um, in the museum uh, where you are at the moment. Uh, it also brings home what is changing in the world. And for the Dutch, uh, this is, of course, a, a very familiar image. All the blue areas on the map are below sea level. Um, then how did I come to the Atlantic? Um, many of the stories and many of the objects in our collection um, tell different stories about the Navy, the, the trading companies, the East India Company and the West Indian Company, uh, about whaling, but we were simply missing uh, a sort of linking pin that combines all the stories. What makes the Dutch and the Netherlands a maritime nation is when they started sailing on the Atlantic. And an interesting book, uh, it's probably mentioned before, by Simon, the, the book Atlantic by Simon Winchester, uh, who says, well, the Atlantic, it has a beginning and the end. Um, it was formed, so it's as a sort of living thing, so you can write a biography on it. And that started uh, at least to, uh, I started to wonder, what can we do with the Atlantic? Uh, people always see the low countries as a, a country next to the North Sea, but in the end, it's the North Sea that connects us to the Atlantic and hands to the rest of the world. And in the last 10 years, the Atlantic has been uh, on the rise in uh, Dutch maritime history. As you can see from just several books I show here, uh, The Dutch Moment by Wim Kloster about war trade and settlement in the 17th century Atlantic world, realm between empires about the second Dutch Atlantic, Dutch Atlantic connections, and even Amsterdam's Atlantic. Atlantic is everywhere and you are in the museum of the Atlantic. Um, here is uh, a map I, well, many school children are familiar with, and most of the times the, the areas are painted in orange, uh, are, is the extent of the Dutch overseas trade network around 6050. And um, just to show you where Halifax and Amsterdam are on the map, I've noted that as well. Uh, but the Dutch Atlantic uh, covers uh, several continents and also combines, of course, uh, the trading routes to Asia. How do we do this? Well, we've already done a lot and we are still um, learning from, from uh, projects we did in the past. Uh, when it comes to the Atlantic, uh, we realize that we are missing objects in our collection. And uh, one way to make it uh, more um, relatable and uh, to uh, apply to a more uh, modern view of the Atlantic uh, we've started collecting stories and we started collecting stories uh, with a, a exhibition on the motor ship Orange, Oranje, uh, in 2018, a passenger liner between Amsterdam and uh, the, uh, uh, Indonesia. Uh, but this um, gave us the experience to also start collecting stories about people who crossed the Atlantic and in a similar way, uh, asking their stories, they bring in uh, photographs, stories, objects, um, and the collection is getting stronger for it. Uh, here are some of the people who have been interviewed for the uh, MS Oranje project, uh, and we will do that in the in the future as well. We also ask uh, people and invite artists and collectives uh, to reflect on Atlantic history. And for many people, Atlantic history is not something 
um, that comes easily uh, and is a positive story. It's uh, in many, many cases, uh, people say, well, it's a story about colonialism, about aggression, about slavery. And that is something that we not only want to uh, present uh, through uh, an exhibition of historic objects, but we also want to um, enable people to tell their stories about how they are feeling about this today. And this is, I think, uh, a new avenue for the, the National Maritime Museum, who was always um, comfortably telling stories through the objects. Uh, but now you see that if you are letting other people tell their story, um, raise their voices in your museum, um, you have a debate, an interesting discussion uh, at many, many times. It's also about sharing, of course, heritage. And, and here you can see a visit uh, from the president of Cape Verde uh, to the library of the museum, uh, where he's shown some of the drawings by Peter Post, uh, a Dutch artist uh, who traveled uh, from the Netherlands uh, to Dutch Brazil in the 17th century. Um, we are also looking at a new presentation of the replica of the East Indian Amsterdam. Um, for long, this was uh, a sort of the largest ship model we have. Uh, it's on the scale of one to one. It's the only ship model you can walk into and get an idea of how uh, a ship model from that time looked like. Uh, but now we feel that that is only part of the story. Many people in the past have asked us, is this a pirate ship? Is this a slave ship? And most of the times the answer was no, it's an 80th century ship and it traveled from the Netherlands to uh, Asia and back and there were no uh, slaves on board, um, and that was the story. But we feel that that is not the story uh, that we can tell anymore. Uh, we really want to invite people um, what this is uh, for them, what it means for them, uh, uh, an image of colonialism, uh, of oppression for some, uh, but also some other people who say, well, in the 1980s when it was built, um, I've learned a lot of the uh, the shipbuilding trade and I'm still working in it. So those are two stories that we want to combine in a new presentation about uh, and on the ship. We also want to interact with people and use um, modern technology. Um, and because before you start to wonder, there is glass before this map. Uh, so uh, they're not pointing on the map, but they're using their mobile phones uh, to look at on a location. Um, that, which they see on the map as well. And people want to do things. Uh, people don't want only just to walk around the museum and, and, and see something, but they also want to be um, asked to, uh, to join in activities. And, and fishing for plastic uh, is, is one thing where people feel that they are actually contributing uh, to climate and to the environment. And every uh, plastic bottle that is fished out of the Amsterdam canals doesn't end up in the plastic soup that is now in the Atlantic Ocean. Um, and with many visitors, uh, we are currently debating things. And um, one of the exhibitions uh, where we started to really do this is Republic at Sea, which opened in 2019 and is an exhibition uh, about the maritime routes of the Netherlands uh, going back to the 17th and 18th century. And the question is, where are the maritime routes of uh, the Netherlands as a maritime nation. And to do this, we also felt that we needed some conversation pieces, as we call them. And uh, this little figurine uh, is one of the, uh, the examples. And it did bring a discussion. Um, this figurine made in China, uh, commissioned by someone in uh, Europe, uh, based on some sketches. Um, probably these sketches were brought by a ship and later on, uh, the little st a statue came back to the U Europe in a ship. Tells you about the um, ideas, the misconceptions uh, of, of different cultures. And uh, for us, this was uh, a way of um, having a debate with people, what it really means, how, how uh, the world is connected, uh, interconnected and cultures are connected. Um, as water connects the world. And um, this is a, a copy from a, a Dutch magazine um, 
It's called Guilty Past, and it uh, used the image of the little figurine that the, the museum had acquired um, to debate whether there should be a museum dedicated to uh, the history of slavery. Um, we also did it with other paintings, like this one, for instance, where we first started to mention that there are actually two people in the same painting. And that's also a new approach for the museum. Um, what we do, and here you can see uh, one of the galleries of Republic at Sea, is to bring this all together um, as one story. Many, many smaller storylines uh, bringing together are, uh, the larger story about the maritime routes of the Netherlands. And this is something that we want to do for the Atlantic as well. Um, sometimes we feel that we don't always see uh, something in uh, an object. And um, in this case, uh, this uh, painting by Franz Post, the Brazilian landscape, uh, we also mentioned that this, although it is an Arcadian landscape, it doesn't show the 25,000 enslaved Africans working for the company, uh, which is the Dutch West India Company on the sugarcane plantations. And that was the entire reason why the West India Company was in Brazil in the first place. So this is something where we uh, repurpose a painting as it was. Uh, it was acquired by the museum to tell the story about the colonial history of the Netherlands, uh, especially about uh, this, the, the short period where they uh, um, wrested the control um, uh, of a, a part of Brazil from Portugal. Uh, but we felt that actually the painting uh, suited better to tell the story about uh, slavery. Uh, we also involve more of stories where uh, women are involved. Um, and I, maybe in many of the maritime museums around the world, uh, they are male dominated. And um, and here, actually, the story about of Constantia Blumhardt is much more interesting than that of Admiral Isaac Sweers. She was connected, well connected in Amsterdam uh, from a rich family from Antwerp who, who came to Amsterdam, um, uh, did business uh, all over the world. And actually, the career of uh, Isaac Sweers, um, he had much to thank uh, Constantia for. And when it comes to multi-perspective, it's also telling stories from another perspective, of course. And this is one of the uh, more recent acquisitions by the National Maritime Museum uh, of two tapestries uh, ordered by the English king uh, from a, a Dutch uh, marine artist, Willem van der Velde, the elder, uh, who came to work for the, uh, the English court. Um, and the tapestry was made in uh, the Royal Tapestry Works in Mortlake near London. And here we see an, an English uh, point of view um, created by a, a Dutch artist um, for a, a royal audience. And, and this is a, a, another way of, of telling uh, a, a story from another perspective. So when it comes to the Atlantic, it, the Atlantic um, exhibition and, and program we have for the for the coming years. Uh, it's not a, only about exhibitions, it's also about research, about uh, collections, but it will not only be uh, an exhibition about slavery. We we really feel that the, the story about slavery and colonialism is a story that has to be linked and, and told in every uh, way in, in the museum. It's just part of the main story of the museum. But yes, of course, in the Atlantic exhibition we are uh, working on, uh, there will be uh, a lot about colonial history and about slavery and about plantations. But it will also be about emigration uh, for the Holland America line, uh, for instance. Uh, it will also be about uh, longstanding relationships and, and how people and, and nations look at each other. This is a replica of uh, the half moon, the half man, uh, the ship that uh, brought Henry Hudson uh, to Manhattan, um, and a replica was made during the Hudson Fulton uh, commemoration uh, in the early 20th century. Um, and basically, uh, that replica is now very interesting for us to tell the story how the Americans, for instance, look at the Atlantic and look at the, the Dutch that uh, uh, came to uh, Manhattan Island. Uh, it will also have a more modern connotation about people at sea. And this is actually uh, one of the uh, exhibitions that we are currently working on and will uh, open um, this autumn. 
uh, about what it does to be on the sea. Uh, many people don't choose uh, to travel the ocean. Uh, we also, we, we always are very happy, of course, as maritime people uh, to be on a boat or a ship, but that doesn't, uh, uh, it doesn't not the case for, for everyone, of course. Um, and it's also about story for of uh, NATO, for instance, um, and the Atlantic Treaty and uh, the role the Dutch Navy played in the Atlantic. So many different stories that we want to bring together uh, on the umbrella of the Dutch Atlantic. Um, it's not there yet. It, there has a lot to be done. Um, we are still two years before the opening of the exhibition, so um, we still have some time. Um, and I want to say you're invited as well, because uh, this is a story and because uh, we want to present the Atlantic history uh, from a multi-perspective. I spoke to many of you uh, in the last few years and uh, everyone mentioned that the Atlantic history is something that they want to do something with. Um, so you're invited as pa to partner us with us and we are also happy to collaborate with you on how to make the Atlantic history a world history and a history uh, from a multi-perspective. Thank you very much and um, a happy birthday, ICMM, with your 50th uh, Jubilee. All right. Yeah, gotcha. Uh, please stay on the line. If I could please have the previous in-person speakers up on the stage and uh, we've got, we're going to invest five minutes in some questions. John, I'll start off while they start traveling up here uh, and then I'll announce a little change in the timetable just to keep you on your toes again. Uh, John, will you be, will the exhibition be ready for us uh, when we're there in 2024? We, we're, we're working, working for, for an opening in 2024. 2024, yes. Great. Well, no pressure. <laughs> all right, did I, have we lost all? Thanks, Christine. Oh, thanks, Louise. All right, uh, folks from the, uh, down below here, uh, any questions for our speakers? Joost, where are you? Typical man. All right, come up um, front here, please. I'll, I'll get the ball rolling. Louis, have you your seaweed uh, partnerships? That's a fully established partnership already in that regard. Could you please just give a few words on how that w originated, the the beginning of the partnership? Yes, of course. So um, the Safe Seaweed Coalition is something that um, the Lloyd's Register Foundation's invested over a million pounds in over the last few years. And it's a global coalition um, covering multiple countries. And the link with um, the foundation started through Vincent de Musier, whose um, book, uh, La Révolution d'Algue, and apologies for my accent, um, shows really shows that connection um, and that um, global move and the importance of seaweed and investing in scaling it up safely and that's what was realized was that there was this element of why would we be the ones working with seaweed aren't we you know a marine classification society and what do we do and all these different challenge areas but ultimately it's an industry where instead of retrospectively adding safety to it when things go wrong after let's invest now let's get it safe and make sure that while it scales up that's done safely and sustainably Are there any, any further questions? All right, I'll keep. Oh, we do have one. Can we have the mic? Richard. It's just a, a really quick question. I was fascinated by uh, all of those talks. Thank you very much indeed. Um, and really looking forward to developing relations between ICMM and Lloyd's Register Foundation. Uh, that question about seaweed, which has always interested me, I wonder in the room, uh, how many people are really aware that uh, there's seaweed content in their collections and stories now? So, one. I bet. I, oh, Richard's got half a hand up. Two, three. Oh, there's a few. Uh, but it's, again, it's one of those areas. I bet there's. Start looking beneath the surface. Ha ha. Or on the foreshore. There'll be loads more. And that's your point, isn't it, Louise? Yeah, get, get scraping those keels and we'll see what we can find. <laughs> Thank you. 
don't, they're not actually here, but the New Bedford Whaling Museum is actually going to do a seaweed exhibition in the next year or two, so they might be reaching out to everyone and definitely to you. Um, and we're doing a lot of partnerships with actual aquaculture farmers um, in our area as well, so lots to talk about, but I'm going to connect to you. <laughs> And we have a terrific growing program in the Chesapeake Bay minorities in aquaculture, which is really starting to be effective. Fred, I see your hand there. I, I had, uh, for uh, Joost, uh, I really enjoyed one comment you made that essentially said that we museums have to live by our creeds. Uh, it's not enough to just say we're green, we actually have to behave that way. Um, and I, it brings to mind an example I recently encountered in Stockholm. Uh, one of Stockholm's prominent art museums, which I will not name, uh, recently opened a new massive addition with a new restaurant on the ground floor operated by a prominent uh, restaurant nearby. Uh, and this restaurant uh, has as its hook for the public that it is a vegan restaurant. That's the only kind of food you can buy there. Mm -hmm. However, all the furniture is overstuffed leather chairs and benches. <laughs> And I can't get anyone there to tell me if this is a result of irony, cynicism, or yeah. ignorance. <laughs> so it's easy to stumble down that path. Th thank you, Fred. We certainly will pay attention to that. And I think this is um, maybe not so much word to the wise, so that would be too much credit to myself. But uh, I certainly will spread the, spread the word to the people who are around the Museum Cafe. Thanks. One very quick anecdote to add, um, if I may. I bought a lovely bottle of red wine once, and um, it said it was um, very, very good with steak and also suitable for vegans. So. <laughs> <laughs> a question for uh, Christina, if I may. Um, so um, I just wonder whether there is enough um, scientific knowledge around um, the um, spread of organisms uh, between different countries, invasive species. Are there any positives from the movement of um, some biologies from one environment to another? Is it really universally bad? Well, <laughs> um, it's hard to even know what some of the baselines are. So when we say native to an area, how, what does native mean? When does that timeline begin? So it's really just when they were noticed for the first time in certain areas. Um, and that baseline certainly too is something I should have mentioned, um, but uh, we're working also with our indigenous tribal nation communities to find out what the baselines were a long time ago. Um, so we're basing a lot of that on Eurocentric views. Um, there's some interesting um, uh, things that have happened because of Clean Water Acts. Um, I was talking to one of our colleagues about this earlier, which is not a very positive story, but um, New York was so filthy for so long and covered in sewage and the waters and the Clean Water Act was so successful that it removed that protection from the pilings um, in the harbor and now they're being attacked by, um, by worms. So, uh, so some of them are positive, some of them are negative. Um, certainly for the Californian striped bass were actually brought out there in aquarium tanks on railroad cars so that people could go fishing for them out there. People who moved out there from the east who missed um, fishing for striped bass. They now say that they're native to California because they've been there for 75 years, so I find that interesting. Um, but I guess that's positive for the fishermen, but that's about it. Um, I don't know any real positive stories about it, to be honest. Um, but there is definitely a lot of research. Um, anyone who's interested in that topic, um, Jim Carlton really is the world expert on exotic um, invasive species. And he's uh, very generous with his time and he has an insane amount of data. And there actually are great databases online where you can look up various species. When I was talking to um, someone in Vienna about having the Alexis Rockman show come there, they said, well, what do invasive species have to do with us? I texted Jim and I said, what does this have to do with Vienna? And he sent me a list of about 50 invasive species right outside of Vienna. So, um, so it's a global issue and it's a very fascinating one and there's a ton of data I'm happy to share with anyone who wants to reach out. Okay. I have Thank a you, question. just as a little side note, if, if I may, just as a little addition, uh, I started um, to study maritime history at Lady University in the early 1980s. One of the wonderful things that I picked up in the courses is that apart from the social and economic side of maritime history, there's a biological side and you already referred to 
uh, seats uh, stuck to the hulls of ships nowadays. Similar thing happened uh, with Dutch East India Company ships and Swedish East India Company ships and uh, Danish ones as well. And in the case of the Netherlands, the seats that were brought in by the Dutch East India Company ships formed the basis, the foundation for the botanical garden in Leiden and in Amsterdam as well. So I guess in retrospect, there is a positive side to all of this, that is, it increased the knowledge of all these indigenous plants and trees and all that as well that people didn't know about. But that's, you know, almost like a sophistic, a sophistic uh, argument. Thanks. I um, have a question to Marika Dean from Sweden. It's for Louise. Uh, because as a fellow foundation person now, I find it uh, fascinating to hear about your strategy, uh, which I perceived was quite detailed. And at the same time, we've been hearing the Shepvarts Museum and other uh, museums here coming with a lot of their own initiatives. So how open is the Lloyd's Heritage Trust to initiatives coming from the outside? How set are you in your kind of program of what you want to fund? That's a very good question, thank you. Um, so we work as part of the Lloyd's Register Foundation, which is a charity established um, to engineer a safer world. And within that, the Heritage and Education Centre, we have our own vision, we have our own mission and a renewed energy. Um, so over the last year, we've been, we've been working to develop um, our new vision um, and we're working towards um, looking at understanding the ocean economy in its broadest sense, past, present and future. And that can, that can be very broad, it can be very encompassing. And the key thing is that we want to work with um, other organisations. We want to invest um, in projects that you guys are doing and work across um, lots of collaborative partnerships, work internationally. So our core mission, yes, it's safety, yes, it's looking at um, the ocean economy, but ultimately that's broad enough to um, encompass lots of ideas and that's what we're here for, um, is to meet you guys and to, to hear what you're all doing and how we can work together. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you, Jeron. appreciate you staying on the line. All right, we're going to have a little bit of a change. Uh, we're going to take afternoon tea now, 10 minutes, and then we're coming back to Vincent and completing the rest of the program after afternoon tea. So if everybody could please be back here in 10 minutes. Just